Hello and welcome to this Wound Care Today Facebook Live seminar. My name's Beverly Wilson, I'm Nurse Consultant for Tissue Viability at Barking, Havering and Redbridge University Hospitals NHS Trust. I'm really pleased to be here this evening to speak to you, but I've got to admit I'm really nervous. It's the first time I've ever done anything like this. So if I trip over my words, I'll apologise in advance. Today we'll be focusing on patient-centred approach to managing exudate. This seminar is kindly supported by Mernica. At any time during the seminar you can submit a question by commenting on the video and I'll do my best to answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the presentation. After the event you can access your certificate of attendance which we will be which will contribute towards your revalidation and your CPD hours. We'll now move on to the presentation entitled Exudate Management, a Patient-Centred Approach. The overview of our objectives for this evening is to just look at the learning objectives, look at the burden of wound care, effective exudate management, patient impact and empowerment, and then we've got two short videos for you looking at a case study from a patient's and a clinician's perspective. We'll then summarise the evening and we'll go over to some questions and answers. So a little bit more about our learning objectives. We want to gain an insight into the burdens of wound care in the UK today. We want to understand the importance of exudate management in wound healing and the challenges it presents. We want to learn appropriate dressing selection and how that can positively impact both patient quality of life and the resources of care providers. And then we're going to talk a little bit about an exudate monitoring system that can help reduce the reliance on care providers and empower the patient. So looking at the burden of wounds, you may want to ask yourself, why are wounds a burden? and who are they a burden for? So I think you'll probably come up with the same answers as me. So wounds are a burden for the NHS and they're a burden for our patients that have to live with those wounds. The NHS has finite resources so we've got to use them wisely. And we also need to look at the impact on clinicians as we're seeing a rise in chronic wounds and how that's affecting um, people's workloads. There was a study done in 2015 that looked at the health economic burden that wounds impose on the NHS. 4.5% of the adult population in the UK has a wound. 2.2 million wound care patients are managed by the NHS. I find that a staggering amount. Chronic wounds cost the NHS 4.5 to 5.1 billion pound every year, which is comparable to the cost of managing obesity, which we know is on the rise. I'm sure some of you will there see a pattern. Your people with chronic wounds often are obese, and then they have the added complication of perhaps having a comorbidity, such as diabetes, which we know is also on the rise. Only 12% of the total cost of wound care is from dressings and most of that is attributed to the use of foams, gelling fibres and wound contact layers. The remaining 88% is on managing infections, maceration, pain and anxiety, looking at delayed wound healing and um, additional nursing and hospital resources. When we look at the cost of pain, pain isn't just about the patient experience. Pain can also cause stress and delay wound healing. When we become stressed, it starts an immuno response, so our immune system kicks into action and it starts to release cortisol, which is a hormone. That impacts then on the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and these cause a delay in wound healing. So it's got a real impact. So getting pain under control is a real, real necessity for clinicians. 
The cost of um, pain has been shown that if we, if we use the visual um, analog scale, the, the, the minimum is um, about 45 pence, ranging up to two, um, 29, uh, two pound 29. So when we look at that and we think that that's analgesia for a 12 hour period, we may look at that and think, oh, it's not much. But when you add that over days, weeks, months, and years in some cases, it contributes to a huge amount of the NHS budget. Work was also done looking at the um, concepts that can impact on wound healing and the cost of those concepts. The highest amount is attributed to maceration. 175 pounds is said to be the cost of maceration in a single uh, occurrence of trauma concept. Maceration is the softening and breaking down of skin resulting from prolonged exposure to moisture. And we've all laid in the bath too long and we can see when our fingers and our toes start to go white and shrivel. So effective management of exudate is essential to get a wound balance and wounds will not progress unless we get that balance right. Problems can occur when we have too much or too little exudate. There must be enough moisture to promote the growth and proliferation to support the removal of dead tissue through the process of autolysis, which we know better as autolytic debridement. So why is exudate important? Well, George Winter, back in 1962, actually started the ball rolling on this. He showed that, the, that wounds healed better in a moist environment. So problems occur when we have too much or too little um, moisture at our wound bed. And also problems can occur when we've got the wrong composition. Problems can lead to delayed healing, patient suffering and an increase in cost. Dry, non-healing wounds do not allow cells to move across the wound bed. And when we've got a good uh, wound healing environment and we've got the moisture balance just right, a wound will go on to heal in that acute phase quite nicely. It'll move through the hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation and maturation stages. And as those acute wounds heal, the exudate level decreases. But that's not the same pattern as we find with chronic wounds. So what is exudate? So right back in the 16th century, somebody called Paracelsus, who was a physician, described exudate, exudate sorry, as nature's um, Sorry, my mind's gone blank. Uh, nature's balsam. And it was recognised very early on the importance that it played to wound healing. Simply, exudate can be designed as fluid leaking from a wound. However, I don't think anything's ever that simple. When, a body sustain, when your body sustains an injury, the priority is to stem any blood flow. So we have to achieve hemostasis. We then move on to the inflammatory stage. And it's in that stage that exudate starts to be produced. And it's a result of, of uh, vasodilation and the stimulation of inflammatory mediators such as histamine and bradykykin. And that increases the capillary permeability, which allows the fluid to leak from the blood vessels into the wound and the surrounding um, area. So in its simplest form, exudate consists of water, electrolytes and nutrients, proteins and inflammatory markers, protein digestive enzymes, they're your matrix melatalaproteinases, or we know them as MMPs, and growth factors, and various types of cells such as macrophages, and our waste products. In reality, there's not just one wound type that can be affected by high exudate. 
any wound can be affected by a high exudate. But we do see it sometimes in diabetic foot, in wounds that have become infected. Um, we see it in pressure ulcers. A variety of wounds can become highly exudative wounds. But it's usually when these wounds get stuck in the inflammatory stage that they become chronic and problematic. So what factors affect exudate production? So exudate production is boosted when there's too much capillary leakage, which then it causes oedema. And we also can get bacterial contamination and a rise in infection that then keeps the, the wound in that inflammatory stage. Too little exudate will indicate that, there's, that the wound's dehydrated, there's decreased uh, uh, levels of blood pla uh, plasma, and we can see sometimes that microvascular disease um, can affect uh, healing in wounds. And this is usually people, um, for example, with diabetes. It affects the small vessels of the lower limbs. So why is exudate a problem? I like to think of cells moving across the wound and when I teach I often say think of um, the cell having ice skates on and it's skating merrily across the wound and it's bringing all the cells we need to actually heal that wound. If a wound has got devitalised tissue in it or it's got slough in it then it's like the cells wading through it in wellies. It's going to take a lot longer to heal that wound. The cells can't get through the wound, so they have to go under it. They burrow under the devitalised tissue, which takes time and delays wound healing. So when uh, wounds produce an insufficient or an uh, excessive amount of exudate, as we just said, it can delay wound healing and that then will increase the management costs and also the cost to clinicians because it's adding to your workload and you're having to pay more visits than you would normally. It can cause quality of life issues for the patient. It can cause distress to the patient due to leakage and malodor. So thinking about this, I just wanted to give you an example of one of my patients. We also, we think of delayed healing or um, wounds being affected by high exudate levels, but I'm going to give you an example of a low exudating wound. I had a patient that had to have his eye removed through cancer, which left um, the socket empty. The clinician said that the wound had to be left open, sorry, that's the surgeon, I should say, and the patient was nursed in a six-bedded bay so can you imagine all the, patient, all the patients around him were seeing this wound? Needless to say, the wound did dry out, but it also dried out with a covering of quite thick slough. And that slough started to become malodorous. I got called in to see the patient and sat down with him and decided what we could do about this. So I asked him what it was he wanted. What did he want us to achieve um, by sorting out this wound? So no surprise, he wanted us to control the malodor. But he was very reticent about me dressing the wound because the surgeon had been adamant it had to remain open. So I went and spoke to the surgeon and was given the go-ahead to sort the wound out. Went back, discussed with the patient, and we decided that we would use a gel into the eye socket to get rid of the slough. We packed that with a non uh, a non-adherent dressing and then covered it with a silicon foam. Within a week, all of the devitalised tissue had been removed and with that, the odour. We kept the dressing uh, covered for the patient and for the, the patients in the bay around him. He felt better about himself and obviously the odour had gone. So can you think of challenges that high exudate may present on a patient? Think of it from your own perspective and perhaps one from the patient's perspective. So challenges that can, uh, high exudate can present would be 
frequent dressing changes, delayed wound healing, we might get local wound infection. The wound can become enlarged, so we know that the maceration can break the wound down further. Wound pain can be increased. Malodor, we can have protein loss and fluid imbalance. And we also can get psycho um, psychological and social factors playing a part. When we look at psychological factors, have you ever had a patient that you've visited or you've, you've um, seen in a clinic and you're dressing the wound every week, go you're going in and seeing the patient every week, so they're getting a visit from you and you may be the only person that they see for that time. You then see that the wound's improving and you tell the patient that the wound's improving and that you know, you'll be able to discharge them soon. You go to visit them next week and suddenly the wound's broken down again. Some patients, believe it or not, would rather live with a wound and have your visit than suffer the social isolation that they are. So when we're getting people to that healing stage, start thinking wider and are there any things that we can do to help their so uh, is social isolation? Can we perhaps get them into a daycare centre um, or a club that will help break that cycle of them being on their own. This slide's quite busy, but basic, what it's telling us that is that a high production of MMPs causes degra degradation of the extracellular matex, and it also inhibits um, the production of growth factors. You won't find growth factors in chronic wound exudate. This in turn increases the inflammatory response so we then get more production of, excel, uh, of extra proteinases that then goes round, sorry, that then goes round and then starts to degrade the wound even more in the surrounding tissues. So it's a vicious cycle. We have to get the extra day under control. There's many ways you can do this. It may be through antibiotics. It may be that the dressing, uh, the wound needs a good uh, washout with, with um, a product that will reduce topical bacteria. Lots of things, but it'll be a whole plan, not just the dressing. But just think about breaking that cycle. So when we think about selecting the right dressing, we have to think about what we want it to do. And in 2007, there was a consensus um, paper put out by some very well-known people in the uh, tissue viability field. And what they suggest is that we ask two things. Does the dressing, so does the dressing stay intact and remain in place throughout the wear time? Does the dressing prevent leakage between dressing changes? Does the dressing cause maceration? Does the patient become allergic to it? Does the dressing reduce pain? Does it reduce odour? Does it retain fluid and trap the exudate? So there are some dressings that will trap the exudate and take that harmful fluid into it and stop it returning to the wound. The other question is, is the dressing? So is the dressing comfortable? Is it conformable? Is it flexible? Is the weight right for the patient? Can they do their normal activities with it? Can it be left in place for a long duration? Is it easy to remove? Is it easy to use? Is it cost effective? So we might want to think about looking at our formularies and having a range of dressings on our formulary, a good middle range dressing that may help reduce the cost of, uh, on the, of wound care on the NHS but obviously that would have to be done through your procurement departments. So then let's look a little bit about the impact on patients of living with a wound and how we can help empower them. How often do we ask a patient what is important for them? And how much are people affected by living with chronic wounds? What do we need to consider? 
A survey conducted in 2018 asked people about their experience of living with a wound. So I'm going to ask you to interact a little bit with me here now. So what percentage of patients do you think felt that their wound impacted on their quality of life? How many percentage of those patients um, didn't see their friends or family as much as they would like to because of their wound? What percentage of patients could not exercise or walk for long? And what percentage of patients complained that their dressing needs changing daily? Well, these are the results of that. So you can see 90% feel felt that their wound impacted on their quality of life. 26% see their friends or family less as a result of that wound. 48% could not exercise or walk for long. And 30% complained that their dressing needed changing daily. The same study, the same survey showed that wound dressings were changed on average five times a week. One in four patients have their wound dressings changed daily and nearly a quarter, 23.7%, visit a nurse at their GP surgery to get their dressing changed. 20% of patients have their dressings changed at home by a nurse or healthcare assistant. So this is all impacting on your time. However, 26% of patients reported that changing the dressings themselves um, was how it got done. 17% reported dressings were changed by a family member or carer. So who's monitoring these wounds? How do patients know when to change a dressing. I think it's important that we start thinking about the patient a little bit more in this. Sometimes we choose dressings that may um, help us. So it'll have a longer wear time because it helps us, not necessarily because it's best for the patient. In the trust that I work for, our vascular consultants do not like us putting dressing pads under compression bandaging. Now the rationale for that is that it alters the level of compression. I know what I'm saying is controversial and I know there's some pa papers out there that would contradict that. However, in my experience, I have seen patients admitted to us and when we take their compression off, their legs are absolutely saturated. The, the dressings beneath are absolutely saturated. And they would have stayed on another few days before their next visit by their district nurse, unless, uh, until they'd actually been in, be, but because they'd been in, sorry, because they had come into hospital, um, they came off sooner. And they had caused lots and lots of damage. So patients want to be involved with their care. Over 40% of people want to be more involved in the decisions they make about their care. And Professor Elf Collins suggests that rather than ask a patient, what's the matter with you? We ask the patient, what matters to you? Now we have a duty and legal obligations as clinicians to involve people in their care. Communication between cl uh, the clinician and the patient is paramount to ensure that we listen to them and take on board what matters to them. How many times have you labelled a patient as non-concordant or not compliant? Have we ever thought why that is? Perhaps when we look deeper into why they're not concordant with their care, we might actually find that what's being done doesn't agree with them. And if we don't give them the opportunity to talk to us and tell us what their problems are, then we won't know why 
they're not concordant with their care. It's too easy to label people. So, if 26% of people are changing their dressings themselves, and a further 17% are relying on a family member or a carer to change the dressing for them, how can we help to make this process easier for them? The majority of people will probably not have had any education on wound management. So how can we help them to do this? Would there be an advantage in having a dressing that helps them to make that decision? I want you to think a little bit now about the dressings perhaps that you use. There's a wide variety out there. And as I've mentioned earlier, the main um, cost of dressings used are usually from our foams, our gelling fibres, and also non-adherent dressings. Think about wounds that need to be packed. Would a patient be able to do that on their own? So there's going to be some dressings that patients will always perhaps need a clinician to come in and help them with. But there may also be wounds that could be managed quite nicely by themselves at home. When we're talking about exudate and the balance of exudate, it's really important that we understand why that balance is important. I know we've talked about chronic exudate, but if we can find a dressing that will trap that and stop exudate going back onto the wound, then it's going to be better for our patients. Also, when we're thinking about dressings, we have talked about thinking about pain and we've talked a little bit about pain. And I'd like to just say there's a good quote from Margot McCaffrey right back in 1968 that said, pain is what the patient says it is and it exists when the patient says it does. So can I ask you just to think about how dressings can help reduce patients' pain as well? So when we're looking at tracking and monitoring exudate progress, we might want to choose a dressing that would help us to know when to change it. Now this type of dressing would be good not only for the patient and for their relatives and their carers, but it also may be good for um, clinicians as well. So we can monitor whether we have to keep changing dressings. Now, I know in a hospital setting, we always think, oh, it's okay, we can change it every day, because we can. In the community, it's not as easy. You'll be looking for dressings with longer wear time. But even within the hospital, we've got to make people understand that dressings don't always have to be changed on a daily basis. So if we could have a dressing that would help our nurses um, know if a dressing needs changing or not, that would be really helpful to us. So with the dressing that you're seeing on the screen now, this has got some uh, equidescent spots on it. So those spots will help us to measure the wound and we can record those measurements so we can see how the wound's progressing at what the exudate level's doing. Because sometimes when we're thinking about exudate, we don't always monitor the level of exudate. So how do we know it's decreasing? So good records are really important and having good management plans that we can look back on and know that they've been uh, evaluated is key. And while I'm talking about that as well, I just would like to emphasise the importance of making sure we have a good uh, holistic assessment of the patient and any wound. If we don't have a good um, holistic assessment, we may miss something. And likewise, when we're looking at a wound, we need to know what are all the dimensions of the wound and making sure that we can monitor whether it's healing or not. And this dressing could help us do that. It will help us see what the exudate level is and whether it's decreasing or increasing. So when it gets to a stage where it's, the, the exudate is now starting to show on the top of the dressing, 
this might be a, a, a time when nurses think straight away, I've got to change that dressing. But as you can see, actually, with this dressing, we can leave it in place because it's not progressed far enough to warrant that change. Okay. Now it's getting larger. Again, we may be tempted just to change the dressing. But actually, it's not beyond the borders that the dressing can cope with at the moment. So we could leave it in place. And now we've got a larger area and now this is when we should consider changing. As you can see, we're now going to the edges of the wound and this dressing isn't going to uptake much more exudate. So this should be a really good, helpful um, dressing for patients. This type of dressing would be really helpful. So patients, relatives, carers sometimes feel a little bit out of their depth when they're being asked to dress wounds and I think this type of dressing is really really useful. So now we're going to go to a couple of short videos. The first one is looking at a patient's perspective of living with a wound. it over two years it started with my son's wedding which was two years last May yeah it has had a big impact on my life um, stopped me from being able to come downstairs I've had to stay in bed on a pressure mattress just to alleviate the uh, help with the sore I've had lots of pumps various pumps which have eventually stop working we've had to try another one which has meant wires everywhere batteries going off in the middle of the night it's people don't realize just how difficult it is with these sores they're easy to get but very hard to get rid of it's getting to the stage where i'd had enough after two years so um, i contacted uh, my doctor and asked if he could contact a plastic surgeon uh, to see if we could do anything about it. And when he saw that the saw hadn't improved, he says, I think we ought to start uh, thinking of surgery. And then uh, Fleur came with these new patches, the Mepilex patches. He said, we'll try these now. And uh, they're comfy. You don't know that you've got them on and um, they can actually lasts for two days which is great because it means that you're not interfering with the sore at all. Another advantage of this patch is that I can shower and it still stays on which is marvellous news because before every time I showered the patch fell off. Within weeks my tracking had gone from six centimetres to three which um, immediately we thought no surgery. If it stops me from having a, a seven day stay in hospital, it's going to save the NHS, save me going through seven days of um, being uncomfortable. I feel that's a great outcome. So it's really interesting to hear from Diane and her experiences. And now we're going to look at the same case study, but from a clinician's perspective. Diane was um, presented to me, I visited her two years ago, and she had some moisture and it developed into an ungradable wound. The different 
dressings that I've tried with Diane um, started from obviously uh, the basic uh, using foam dressings and we was packing the room because it was ungradable and also it was um, quite deep. Um, Diane's had a lot of previous dressings um, to try and find one that we can keep on. The glory of having Mepilex Border Comfort is actually it stayed on for two days which is a massive bonus for us and for Diane because Diane gets her quality of life back plus we've reduced two nurses going daily. Having the dot marks of the um, to measure the extra date levels on the dressing has been um, a bonus not only for us but also for Diane and the carers because um, Diane can ring up in the morning and say it doesn't need changing because the extra date levels are, are low so therefore stops us having to come and visit to change the dressing. Since we've started using um, Mepilex Border Comfort, it's actually improved the wound bed. So um, we're not using a primary dressing, we've used Mepilex Border Comfort as the, as the primary dressing and not had to use it as a secondary like we had other dressings in the past. There is talk now of maybe not having surgery, that to us is just a blessing. I would describe Mepilex Border Comfort in three words as cost effective, easy to apply and comfortable for patients. So I'm sure that you found those in, uh, videos very interesting. Um, it's always good to hear from, from a patient and also from your peers about their experiences. So just to summarise this session and to conclude, we've looked at managing chronic wounds effectively, that it minimises the risk of complications and additional costs. We've looked at an appropriate dressing selection. We've looked at how inappropriate dressing selections can delay wound healing how can they can affect the quality of life for patients. We've seen how self-care is important to patients and how accurate monitoring of extra date can support a patient and empower them um, to cope with wounds on their own. So if you would like to know more about this subject, and about the, the dressing that we've discussed this evening, please speak with your Monica account manager and their details are on the screen for you now. So question one is from Karen Simpson. Is there a nutritional and dietary advice that we should be giving to our patients with high exudate? Well, Karen, I think nutrition is important in wound healing anyway. So my advice uh, for patients is always to make sure that they have a colourful plate, making sure that we get all the nutrients that we need within the, uh, the, the food that we're eating. But we do know that protein plays a big part. So if we could actually get patients just to increase their protein intake, it doesn't have to be massively, um, then that can help. There's also some debate about whether medication can help looking at um, whether vitamin C, for cetera, uh, example, can help with nutrition. Um, doctors like to prescribe it. Uh, there's no real evidence of its effect, but I don't see that it would do any harm. So question two is how would you handle patients who want dressings changed daily? I think this is about discussing with the patient and involving them in the care and making them understand, if you can, I know some patients would be very difficult, but making them understand why you don't want to change the, the dressing daily. If we can explain to them that keep changing the dressing, for example, if it doesn't need changing, what's happening is we're dropping the temperature of the wound and that prolongs the healing process because it takes quite a few hours to get the wound up to temperature again to start that healing process. 
So I think it's about communication and I think it's about helping patients to understand that it's not that you don't want to do the dressings every day, but there's a valid clinical reason that they shouldn't be changed daily. Uh, Sarah wants to know, how do you document extra date levels? Well, Sarah, I think it depends on what you use in your trust or in your um, area. We have a wound care chart which we can document um, the level and we just look at it very simply as to whether it's um, none, low, moderate or high. But there are other tools out there that can help you um, that may, may just look at it a little bit differently. Um, it could be that the higher level they, they call corpus levels. So I think it's about knowing. Um, I think a gauge, a, a bit of a rule of thumb, is that if you're having to change your dressing every day, you've probably got a high level of extra date. So um, I can't tell you exactly, but I, I know that's what I would document. Um, and document you know, what the wound looks like. Is it macerated? Is, it sa is the dressing saturated when you're taking it off? And, and that should help you. Um, next question I've got is, how do you talk to patients about stress if it can impact on their wound healing? Well, people become stressed because of the wound. And it may actually not just be because of the wound, it could be a lot of factors. So I think if we can give patients time to sit down with them and discuss what problems they may be having, and we may have to look wider than just the wound. Um, I think sometimes, especially when people are not having their relatives uh, uh, come in. I know, for example, I had a lady once whose, whose grandchildren wouldn't visit because of the odour uh, on the wound. And that can be obviously causing her a lot of stress because she wasn't seeing her family. But I think, again, it is about communication. I, I really can't stress enough, and I'm talking about stress, but I can't stress enough that communication is paramount. And just by giving people time, we're in such a busy world, we, we have such a busy caseload, we're running from one patient to the other, and I know that's the same for you out there. If we could just take a little bit of time to talk to patients and find out what the problem is, and to see how we can get um, their, their quality of life better, and that may help to reduce the stress. Um, Janine Anderson, how can you manage exudate in patients using compression bandaging? Well, as I said, uh, Janine, in my presentation, in our trust, we're not allowed to put um, padding under the compression. We are allowed to put padding over the top of the compression. But again, sometimes uh, with compression bandaging, it needs to be changed more frequently than the once a week. And again, it's this is about caseload. I know often people can only get in once a week because their caseload is so high, but that's detrimental sometimes to the patient's wound, but it is about resources. But I think you need to make sure that the dressings that you're using, if you are putting them under compression, will absorb and lock away that extra date. And you're going to need to gauge it and you're going to have to need to go in and see if that dressing's performing as you want it to perform. And that might take a few visits before you know that you've got it right. So Sarah wants to know, is there a link between patients with cardiovascular disease and the level of extra day that would develop? Um, cardiovascular disease in itself, I don't think, but I could be wrong, but definitely people with um, congestive cardiac failure. So CCF, we know, can actually impact uh, on the level of extra days because in CCF, we know that we get widespread in edema that can actually, um, gravity pulls that down, especially in leg ulcers, it pulls it down into the lower limbs and that makes a problem with the extra day. Um, in itself, um, if, if, if somebody's uh, had a heart attack, for example, because they've got um, some, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the heart, the narrowing of the blood vessels in the heart, that in itself 
Um, I don't think alters the level of extra date, but I do know that CCF can. Abby wants to know, what about if you, the trust policy is for dressings to be changed every three days, but the extra date level does not warrant this? Um, well, Abby, I think there's a problem if your policy is saying that, because dressings should be changed based on the wound, not on a criteria that says every three days. We have to change dressings according to the state of the wound. So if your, your policy is saying at least every three days, um, they may have a reason for that, that they want to uh, monitor the wounds. But I think that needs, you know, I, I can't comment on your policy, but I personally don't think that's right. I think it should be based on a holistic assessment and doing what's right for the wound. And it may be the wound will progress and heal much quicker if the dressing remains in place longer. You also have to look at the wear time of the dressing and you have to look to see whether it's able to stay on for, for the required length of time that you want. Um, so I would be a little bit concerned if we were changing people's dressings every three days and it wasn't warranted. Because as I say, every time we change a dressing, we drop the temperature of the wound and that delays healing. And we have a final question now. How can you support someone living with the demands, well, sorry, living with dementia that keeps taking their dressing off, which delays healing? Oh my goodness. Um, I don't think I know the answer to that. It's very, very difficult and it depends obviously where the dressing is and where it's located. Um, I'm assuming, and perhaps I shouldn't because they do say assuming makes an ass of you and me, but um, I'm assuming that we may be talking about uh, a leg dressing here and so the patient can get to it easily and, and take it off. Um, challenging, uh, I don't know, perhaps try uh, putting a second, if, if for example if somebody's in compression and the patient can get to it, try putting the, um, the seam of the dressing to the back of the leg where the patient may not be able to see it easily and then perhaps try putting uh, uh, something like a tubifast, uh, tubi grip or tubifast over that to um, stop them. So they've got something else to play with so they can play with the, the outer dressing without touching the inner dressing. But that's a tough one and uh, whoever sent that in, good luck with that one. So this concludes our live training session. Any questions that I've been unable to get to today will be answered over the next 24 hours. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Monica for the support of this event. To access your certificate of attendance, please follow the link below, uh, uh, sorry, the link shown on the screen now. I hope that this has helped you gain a better understanding of how to manage Exudate. If you've enjoyed this event today, please like the Wound Care Today Facebook page for details of upcoming events. And thank you for watching and for your patience with my uh, very tentative uh, presenting this evening. Good evening. <laughs>